Hey everybody, Josh back with another quick video. Um, I wanted to dis to show how um, pancake Geiger probes are constructed um, because I actually broke one and this is the one I broke and slightly disassembled even further to kind of illustrate how these things work. But I think I'm going to start with this little really rough diagram that I uh, made kind of describing how Geiger Mueller tubes operate in general. So this is a side view, sorry about the white balance, but this is a side view of a Geiger Mueller tube kind of like uh, the one I just showed in the picture. So what it has is a metal shell and when it's fully assembled and working it'll have a very very thin mica window um, to give you a sense of its like its density. It's 1.0 to 2.0 milligrams per square centimeter. Um, and that's mostly important because it determines what kind of particles are allowed through and at what energy levels and what percentages they are. Um, this tube happens to be good for detecting alpha, beta, and gamma particles. And I think at um, 1.8 to 2 milligrams per square centimeter, it can detect um, alpha particles up like starting at 2.5 MeV, which is actually you know decently energetic. Um, but anyway, so the basic construction of this, if you're looking at it from the side, is that it has a casing, and I believe for this specific one, it's a combination of iron and chromium, or chro uh, yeah, chromium, I believe. I could be wrong. Um, and then it's got like this little uh, bulkhead to connect the anode. This is where the positive voltage goes. So. Um, you like usually stick a little sleeve over this with the wire that comes off of it into the Geiger um, counter and then this is connected to ground and that's usually uh, in the case of our probe that I'll be showing today this is actually connected to ground by set screws that are that tightly hold it in place um, and then there's of course an insulator to prevent the positive and negative from uh, uh, dead shorting but anyway, so I'll flip this over and kind of explain how Geiger tubes work um, to detect radiation. So there's a lot here, but I'll kind of go through it. So basically the way this works, this is the same tube. Um, this is our anode, our insulator, and um, anode lug. And basically what happens is, as an alpha particle passes through the very, very thin mica window, through the filler gas, what happens is that when the particle collides with or is able to um, split off electrons, that's called an ionization event, um, it causes um, electrons to split off. And because there's a 900 volt potential between this and the casing on the unit, it'll actually cause the electrons to accelerate towards the plate towards the anode because it has a positive charge and electrons have a negative charge so they want to neutralize by hitting the anode. So while that's happening the ions created strike other um, atoms particles in here and break off additional electrons causing several other ionization events and I believe this is called a Townsend avalanche and this is how um, Geiger counters detect radioactive particles is Basically what happens is this creates a lightning bolt which creates a short or like a zero potential between the casing and the conductive material and the anode. So, and that actually kind of like looks like this if you plot it out. So you'll suddenly see um, as the avalanche occurs it'll actually go to ground because there's a dead short. It's basically like a little lightning bolt cutting through there. And then the fill gas, um, which most tubes use halogen, actually causes the circuit to close eventually anyway and you know and another side effect that makes the avalanches more pronounced is sometimes at the ionization events it'll create an ultraviolet photon which also which are also energetic enough to cause additional avalanche events and basically the way that the avalanche events work is when you have the initial ionizing event it'll actually create like an ionizing electron which is, or not create it, but uh, it'll actually, the ionizing electron will continue, and then an electron that's liberated from another atom will actually 
split off and continue the path or continue the cycle to get to ground. And then when that shorts out, that's what creates the click on the Geiger counter. And that's what you actually um, basically count to figure out how many uh, radioactive particles have collided at a certain point. And you can also correlate that with um, um, radiation dose rates and later on exposure if you know what isotope you're measuring. So you can say like, I think this for the particular Canberra tube that I have, um, or that I just replaced, um, it is something like 3,000 or 33,000, sorry, it's either 3,000 or 3,300 um, counts per minute per microronchin. So that's a way that you can kind of like equate those. Anywho, so I'll actually show the real parts of the tube now. So here you can see um, the disassembled tube. This is the outer casing, the cathode. Um, and you can actually see where the set screw here on the side um, connected that into the body of the probe, and I'll show the probe in a minute. And then here's the thin mica window. It's extremely fragile and very, very light. And this, uh, this allows alpha, beta, and gamma particles through while holding the halogen quench gas inside the body. And then this is the anode here. And you can actually see that it's designed to be big and round and have lots of contact points um, to encourage as many Townsend, or as, so that it can detect as many Townsend avalanches as humanly possible. So that's kind of a cool thing to see that little grid there. Um, and kind of the fun thing about pancake probes that makes them unique is that they're, they tend to be fairly sensitive just because the detection surface area is much bigger here than it is if you have a tube that's like a Geiger-Muller tube that's cigar-shaped like this pencil. You're only going to detect um, events that pass through it this direction. And like you've got some length but not a lot of width, so you're not going to get as many events as you would with something like this just because of the geometry of the detector. But anyway, so let me show you a little bit here. Um, so basically, I took this damaged probe out of, or the damaged pancake tube out of this probe here. And you, know, you can see here the three set screws um, that we use to hold the, to center the probe and a little protective screen on top of it. But yeah, it's actually really simple inside. So basically the outside of this connector is the cathode and the anode wire, there's a little, yeah, let's see if I can focus here, there we go. There's a little gold connector in there, which is the anode. And that allows voltage to pass through some anode resistors, um, which are inside the neck of the detector in fact, they sit right about here and directly connect to the little shoe connector that you clip on to the, uh, to the end of this guy here. But yeah, so that's actually how these probes are constructed and the cylindrical like cigar shaped probes, um, pickle probes if you want to call them that, are actually fairly similar. They just have a different geometry and usually have just a single long piece of wire running down the middle as opposed to a grid like this. But anyway, hopefully that demystifies a little bit about how uh, how radiation detectors work for you. Cheers.